good morning everybody it's Tom Christie back in the painting studio it's been a while since I've posted a video a lot of things going on with family moving our son uh, from California some competition stuff going on so uh, anyway I wanted to get back on the channel I actually got a request from uh, a subscriber I'm gonna read that leave his name off uh, but Tom I've watched most of your videos have enjoyed them all. I am 90 and I'm a decent carver, but have a problem with drawing a good looking free flowing feather pattern. I would love to see a video on that. Thanks. I got that note and I thought it's a great point, especially for beginning carvers. Uh, when I started carving and especially if you don't hunt and you can't get uh, your hands on birds to study their feathers, it's kind of where do I start and what are some of the patterns um, of feathers. Now it's going to depend on the species. So again this is primarily for beginning carvers that might need some help like this person with some how to draw a pleasing uh, feather pattern and obviously it depends on the species uh, but this will be more generic. I'm going to use the old uh, shuffler decoy here and we'll do some sketching of feathers. I'll try to hit the uh, points that I've seen common mistakes along with approaches that I think you should use to kind of get a nice pleasing flow and composition to the feathers as you put them on. And I'm going to hit on a couple of specific topics. I'm old so I have to make notes for myself. We're going to talk about feather flow first. So some general patterns of feather flow in various areas of the decoy or bird and uh, how, to, how to handle that and where the feathers are flowing. Obviously shape is critical and it's species dependent, but we'll talk a little bit about shape and uh, also spacing of feathers. I think this is a, a big common mistake a lot of beginning carvers make and that is to make every feather the same size and it ends up looking like fish scales as opposed to a nice pleasing uh, feather flow and some groups of feathers that kind of break things up and make it look more natural than a very scaly regular pattern. And then I want to talk just briefly about projection. Some of the uh, some of the projection from a distance is important in the feather flow layout and I'll talk more about that and probably provide some examples. It's amazing to me sometimes the way things project from a distance and if you're in a competition where the judging is done from a distance that becomes a critical uh, marker for your decoy and if you don't break up the feather patterns you can see uh, things that you wouldn't expect from a distance. So we'll talk more about that as well. That kind of gets into refinement and more advanced techniques, but as long as we're talking about it, I thought we might as well touch on that projection from a distance. So let's start with feather flow and uh, I've got my chalk pencil. This is just a charcoal pencil that I use. You can get at Dick Blick's anywhere that sells white charcoal. and. Uh, it does a nice job of doing layouts and you can correct any mistakes you make as you go. I'm kind of planning this out as I go. So uh, before we jump into chalk pencil on the decoy, I wanted to use a taxidermy example. This happens to be a hen gadwall. And uh, we can look at some of the, the feathers. Uh, starting with the side pocket, just a few things to note. They, get the feathers get larger as you go towards the rear of the side pocket. Again, some of these are very basic concepts. If you're an advanced carver, you're not going to want to spend time listening to me talk about this. If you're a new carver and just starting out and you don't know ducks that well, uh, hopefully this will be helpful. So these feathers tend to flow a little bit upward especially as you get to the top of the side pocket, they form a cup uh, and a pocket where the wing tucks in behind the, that grouping of feathers. So take a look at the variation we've got here. 
I mentioned a fish scale. This is very unlike fish scales. Here are three feathers that are kind of lined up with pretty much the same distance between them. And then you get back here and there's a gap here where there's more of the base of the feather exposed. Here's another feather very close to that feather. Some more uh, larger feather exposed. Here's a feather that's kind of, you can see the internal markings of the feather. Uh, it's my point, what is my point? There's variation and it really helps to try to put variation into your painting scheme and your feather layout um, to make the bird look more natural, like, like a real bird. Let's look at the scapulars up here. They tend to droop down towards the side pocket, particularly on the edge here, so they're not straight back. That's another common mistake, and we'll show examples of that is feathers just pointing very rigidly straight back towards the tail of the decoy all over the bird. You want these feathers to kind of droop down towards the side pocket. And as you get to the back in the cape area, they're gonna to tend to droop in the opposite direction towards the center line of the bird. And then these in the middle kind of split the difference. Again, take a look at the, the layout here. Here's two feathers uh, and you would think they would be equidistant, not so in the way that the bird is laying and the feathers are laying. Where they're attached to the bird, we don't know, but I'm sure there's a regular pattern. But by the time they get out here and they get tucked in and folded over, there's variation. Here's a, here's a long scapular feather with the internal marking showing and the next feather is a little shorter, shorter, and then a longer one again here. Longer in terms of the amount of feather exposed. Okay, these are the tertials, and this is a key area as you're doing layout where it's very species dependent, how much uh, distance there is between the tip of the tertial and the start of the scapulars. That's these feathers. So you need to get reference materials so that you can get that right. If this is way too long or way too short, it really jumps out at you. Let's take a quick look at the breast of the bird. And on a hen gadwall, uh, you can't see, you can see individual feathers, but if you look closely, you can see kind of groupings of individual feathers in little groups. Like here's, I don't know if you can see this, I'll try to tilt it up, but there's one, two, three, kind of in a group right there. So this is an area that's very easy to make it very um, scaly looking as well. And we try to break that up as much as possible, put some randomness, patterned ran randomness, if that makes any sense. <laughs> is what you're going for because there is there is some pattern to what we're seeing and some flow but kind of random in the spacing you can see these feathers flow from the the base of the neck down around and then line up with the side pocket feathers here same here kind of down around and then line up with the cape feathers on the back and I mentioned cape, that's this little area between the, the two uh, wing sections and scapulars that kind of goes back about this far and goes right to the front on both sides here. It's not a hard line on a real bird. It's pretty soft and subtle, but uh, we'll talk about that later. One more thing on the head feather flow. You can see it, they start with small feathers here. They tend to curl or angle up a little bit on the cheek and then turn the corner here and go back down towards the back. And all of these feathers meet 
at kind of the center of the head in the back. And as they go down to the neck, they tend to flow. You can see some flow here um, from a center line here, kind of flow around the neck and angle a little bit towards the back as they go around the neck. Okay, so just a few shots of uh, a taxidermy bird so that we can keep those concepts in mind as we're looking at the decoy. All right, let's talk flow first again. Flow, we just talked through, and I'm gonna just pencil some chalk lines on here. And I often do this when I'm laying out, uh, just to give myself a little guidance. These flow lines start at the neck and they widen out as they get lower on the bird. I'm not trying to draw feathers at this point in the center line, pretty lined up on the center of the breast. As you go around this side, I'm just doing all of this fast and freehand, so I apologize if it's not uh, it's not going to be perfect. But I'm trying to convey the concepts here, which is more important. Now, as you get to the side pocket, these breast feathers start to line up here on the side, and the flow of the side pocket feathers is little bit up like we talked about and that allows these feathers to form this nice cup and uh, kind of shed water so these flow lines are going not not this way but definitely not straight back okay the scapulars we talked about um, tend to droop a little bit in this angled in this direction and then as you get to the top of the decoy they're going to angle a little bit in the opposite direction towards the center line here and in the middle they kind of split the difference okay again here's that reference dimension i talked about earlier how much tertial is exposed before the scapulars start and uh, that is, again, species dependent. So you need to check your references on that. The cape feathers, pretty much, I've got the cape. This is not my carving, by the way. This is a Keith Mueller carving that uh, is, was made into foam decoys. And Lutish sells those decoys. So the, the uh, cape kind of lines up in between. This cape, by the way, um, while we're talking about it, a lot of uh, beginning carvers think they need to gouge that cape down and create a big valley between the scapular groups. This cape actually overlays those wings and scapulars as they tuck into the body. So I like this group to be slight, slightly lower than the cape, the way he's carved it here. I think that's important. Okay, and let's talk just briefly about feather flow on the head. I've got some texturing on this particular bird's head, uh, but feathers are gonna start up here, kind of flow upward till they get to the cheek area above the the eye, they're going to start here and wrap up and around. So again, these are the flow lines. And then in the, I talked about how they meet in the center of the back of the head. So they don't go up and stay up. They start coming back down so that we have a nice flow on the back of the head there. And then as you get into the cheek, they start angling down and back like that towards the base of the neck. And 
and then they split the difference in the middle here. By split the difference, I mean these feathers are going to be pretty straight up and down, but then we start in this direction on this half of the bird, and we start in this direction on this part of the center line. Okay, that's a little bit about flow. Now let's do some common mistakes before we lay out our feathers the way I think they should be laid out. Okay, I've already talked about this, but I want to demonstrate um, that a lot of people just go straight back and all the same size and they line them all up perfectly. And they're straight back, there's no curvature at all. You might say, hey, that looks pretty good. Uh, <laughs> that's not what we want. Let me get uh, something to erase this. I'll be right back. And the other common mistake is no flow between feather groups. So people are working on breast feathers, kind of rounded, and all of a sudden they've gone to a different shaped feather and there's no natural transition between the feather groups. So that's something you want to work on. So let me start on this side. It's nice and dry. And uh, we talked about we want these kind of flow lines. It's okay to leave those flow lines in place, especially with chalk pencil. And I'm going to start laying in these feathers. Now these feathers come up from the belly and kind of angle up in this direction. And they get smaller as they approach the belly. These feathers back here are, are pretty large and on most puddle ducks, they're relative, they kind of narrow at the back. Now I'm gonna put a feather in here now I'm going to vary the distance between feathers. I've got a nice feather that I can show some internal markings there later. But like we saw on the Gadwall hen, I'm going to put a few feathers closer together there, a couple of feathers. I'm going to go back with uh, larger spacing. And I'm making the feathers smaller as I go forward. Not tiny, that's another thing. You can't, you can't go too quick and all of a sudden you end up with breast feathers back here on, this, on the side pocket. This you kind of just have to use your artistic eye and, or at least I do. And in, in a lot of my painting videos, I don't show the layout work that I do and that's not to hide anything, it's just, it's time consuming. And so I thought that's another reason to have a layout video like this, where we can spend some more time on layout and uh, not take away from the, the painting process. Some of these videos get way too long. I'm gonna bring a feather up a little bit here. You can see and there's a feather I've penciled in here. I'm going to start this feather up here. And that's another form of variation. Is we don't want them all lined up like soldiers, like we talked about before. We want some variation. Now I'm going to put a feather here that kind of crosses the juncture there between those two. And I'm going to do enough here to give you the concepts, but not try not to put you to sleep uh, because a lot of this is very repetitive. 
but I just want to show you enough to give you a feel for it. Now, I'm going to put a feather down there, one here. This is the value of using the chalk pencil. I just changed the shape of that because I didn't like the look of it. And you, these need to be pleasing to the eye when you're done. And that's, that's probably the toughest part of this to convey to people. How do you do that? Uh, it helps to have a, an artistic eye. <laughs> All right, I think I'm, I've done enough there. Hopefully give you the, the concept. And let's reiterate the concepts. Variation in the distance between feathers, but keeping the feathers um, the appropriate size. Let me just reiterate what that means. If I go back and let's say I want to put these two close feathers here, but I make this one like this, all of a sudden this feather is this wide. This feather is way too narrow to be in that position on the bird this way. So it looks like it belongs up here somewhere with some of these feathers. So as you're doing your layout, you have to keep in mind what size is this feather, how much of it is exposed and how much of it is tucked in. But I've got the appropriate size there of those feathers uh, since they're close together. And I'm gonna add another one in here and it needs to tuck under this feather. I'm probably being redundant, but hopefully you can see that the size, you, you often see that as a common mistake. People will put feathers in positions that are way too small or way too large for where they should be on the bird. So just keep that general rule in mind. Larger back here, smaller, 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 until you get up to the, the breast feathers. So let's spend some time on the uh, breast feathers next because they kind of tie into this. All right, I'm gonna start at the neck. The feathers are gonna be smaller up there. I've got very faint flow lines here, but a lot of times these breast feathers group in groups of three and four. So I'm gonna start another row here, make sure I'm in camera, yeah. Now, what, what I don't want is all of these lined up again, and they just become redundant rows. This is my preference, there are people that like to do this and that there's nothing wrong with that i'm just saying it can get too redundant and where these end up crossing they kind of give us stripes we want a few stripes but not long continuous stripes uh, in my opinion so i'm gonna erase that I'm going to go to the other side here since it's dry. So I'm making these slightly larger as I go down. I'm angling them back, keeping in mind I've got to line up with side pocket feathers here. But I'm going to break, break them up a bit by uh, putting a feather in here. I'm going to go back up. And I'm going to look for opportunities like right here to split the difference, so to speak, and put a feather right in there between these two groups. I like having small groups of feathers like that, but I also like then breaking them up so they're not too long, too continuous, too regular. I'm going to start another row down here. These start to turn the corner. But I could go over and split the difference there and start a feather here so that we kind of break these groups up a bit.
And again, think about uh, varying the width or the uh, the distance here from here to here. I'm going to put one close. I'm going to put another one close. Then I'm going to space it out, go a little farther. So I'm varying the spacing like we did on the side pockets back here. I've got a lot of feathers on here. You can use these same concepts and not put as much detail. It's just up to the carver and what you're trying to accomplish, how much feathering you want to put on your decoy. If you're doing a gunning decoy, you probably wouldn't want to put or need to put this much detail into it. If it's a bird for the mantle, you may want to make it as accurate to the live bird as you can. We'll go one more row on the breast feathers here. I'm going to stop with a group of one, two, three, four there and start splitting the difference here and put some variation in. Okay, that's probably enough on breast feathers, but as you, those will turn the corner and size-wise start to tie into these feathers on the side pocket. Okay, let's go to the scapulars. I had mentioned that they droop down from the side. So once we get this distance determined, and Keith's got kind of stopped the carving here of his tertials, so I'm going to trust that that's about the right position to drop in a scapular there. So notice I don't have the complete feather because these scapulars tend to tuck behind the side pocket. So on some of them, you may want to show a little return on the feather. On some, you may want to angle it down where you only see the top side of the feather because the rest of it's tucked underneath. Again, these get smaller as you go forward. Now from the top, I'll put something in here. I'm gonna put a scapular in this location. Again, I'm gonna vary distances between feather tips a bit, all the while keeping the size of the feather in perspective. Notice how I'm going down to the top side of this, and these are drooping somewhat down as well. Let's see. It's not a perfect science. Again, these kind of tend to hug the center line and go in this direction. And then these ones in the middle kind of split the difference. I need to make that feather larger. I made it too small for its position. So again, just going back. And you can go over these multiple times, and I do until I get a nice pleasing look. And I think that's really important. This is where the composition comes in and it takes some trial and error to get a pleasing flow. So the flow, again, kind of down in this direction, over in that direction, the side pocket flow up. Let's talk about this area right here. These feathers are much smaller than the big side pocket feathers that overlap them. And they also have flow kind of from the underside up. So they're much smaller, as I said. Here's another, another area where you don't want to just line them up like soldiers. 
but look for areas to break up lines like this. When you get away from that line from a distance, all you see is the line. And then you, you're wondering as a judge, what, what's that big white mark on the side uh, there? The feather layout can really hurt you. So keep that variation in there. So again, these are angling up, but I'm also gonna break it up a bit. See, I went one here, one here, and then kind of, I'm calling it splitting the difference, but basically start the next feather at that junction point. And that helps you break things up a bit. You get to the tail coverts up here, they get a little bit larger and they're gonna angle down in this direction. Okay. So these down here are starting coming up in this direction. All right, on the underside of the tail, there are some larger feathers that tend to be right along the underside of the tail here up to a center point and then these feathers start to get smaller as you go down towards the belly of the bird and then in the center here we can kind of again throw in variation in distance Don't line anything up in too many straight lines. And these angle up towards the tail. You get the you get the idea, hopefully. And then these are the smaller feathers that start laying in. Keep in mind the flow is going up center line up towards the underside of the tail and up on the side just a quickie on the cape i normally start with a central feather and these tend to oh i'm following this guideline which is kind of the edge of the cape as it overlaps. And so I don't want to split that. It look look awkward, so I'm coming along the edge of that cape and going inward. Same thing over here. Again, varying some of the distances. You're getting sick of me saying that, but I'm trying to drive that point home. And then, then look for uh, places to overlap feathers. Here's an opportunity to overlap two feathers and you end up with a little bit of a, a difference there as opposed to a full rounded feather here. So I can do this fast uh, and I'm not trying to be super accurate here today. Uh, but these, these feathers start to get smaller then as they approach the back of the neck here. And then they tie in, kind of turn the corner here. So everything flows together. You, you don't want any severe angles between feather groups uh, so that it, it it looks unnatural. So you're trying to, f I'm back to those flow lines again, kind of keep those in mind as you're laying out your feathers. Okay, so just, as, just a reminder, don't do this. Every feather, same size, same distance between them. 
try not to do this where all the feather edges line up along the whole length of the decoy because when you paint those and you get away from them let me I'll just keep going down here to drive the concept home these feather edges all start to line up and then from a distance you end up with uh, light lines but hard almost straight lines on your decoy and that's a killer for projection from a distance to me uh, because it looks unnatural and if you do the whole thing and line it up with the breast feathers you end up with a line from front to back and it looks like the bird is striped so very uh, the crossovers you you want you do want to highlight the edges of some of these small groups of feathers because that helps break things up and make it look natural but try to avoid the the scaly stripe syndrome there it has a name just a quick final note on um, the head feather flow if you're doing a hen I wouldn't do all the layout with the chalk pencil I would maybe pencil in some flow lines and uh, then this would all be paint painting the tick marks on a hen but I would put two and three small groups together and again try to avoid the striped appearance and it's not easy to do it's easy easier to line everything up and you end up with kind of a striped looking hen's head but vary these groups so that you're following the flow lines but not ending up with that type of a look more Okay, I've got the flow lines kind of in my mind. And this would be paint brush. So I I don't do a layout on a hen's head. I just start painting, but you might want to do a layout with your chalk pencil and give you a chance to chain the, change things. I kind of keep a V shape in mind. By V shape, I'm talking about like that. So three, group three, four, go a little different direction, but still following the flow. I've created a gap between that line of dots and the next line of dots or marks tick marks and I've ended up out of camera so I apologize for that but kind of go back and forth and then I'm thinking of the flow lines that are coming down and they're starting to wrap down here up above the eye I've kind of got some flow lines combed into this bird. These are going to come up. Again, the, the crown of a hen is going to darken normally. And you can check out, you know, some of my painting videos for how to do, uh, how to do that with paint. 
But while I was on the layout uh, video here, I thought might as well just do a little bit of head layout. And then those are going to come back to this center line like we talked about and kind of flow in. They don't just come in at a hard angle and you end up with flat looking, awkward looking rear of the head. These need to flow down to the center line. This uh, shoveler's head was kind of tucked down, so we didn't get much of a chance to look at the neck. So I made this little extension, as awkward as it may look, uh, just so we can look at the, the neck. And again, there's kind of a center line, and the flow is going to come from that center line back in this direction. And it's going to come kind of to a point on the rear of the neck here where these flow lines come together. Then on this side, and again, you don't want a center line. You don't want a hard uh, distinction between directions here. So you can kind of line some up in the center, go both directions but now these pull down in this direction and line up in back here again okay The summary shot. Here's one side where we kind of lined everything up. Equal spacing doesn't look very natural. It kind of creates hard lines on the decoy. This side is a little softer, broken up, different spacing, correct flow, and just makes a softer looking bird overall. All right, everybody, I think we'll call that a wrap on the feather flow and layout uh, video. I hope it's been helpful. It may be more, uh, very boring, but I think it's a critical part of making a natural looking decoy. And I appreciate the suggestion to put a video together to help particularly newer carvers get started on laying out their birds. Until next time, Tom Christie signing out. Good carving to you.